Hey guys, uh, welcome to uh, Taming OpenStack with Ansible. So um, I wanted to kind of, I, I kind of want to have a different talk. You know, you always have your, your chefs, your puppet talks. And um, back uh, when I worked for Blue Box, uh, we did quite a bit of uh, work with Ansible. And I thought it'd be kind of, uh, kind of interesting because, you know, uh, I've worked quite a bit on the, the uh, chef cookbooks for, that are in StackForge. I've done a lot of uh, deployments with chef and, you know, sometimes it's, it's a little daunting for people to kind of just step into those StackForge cookbooks and, and uh, kind of see from point A to, you know, point Z exactly, all the attributes that have to get set, everything that needs to get done. It's a little, it's a little daunting and unless you're really embedded in that uh, kind of that community, um, it can be difficult. So uh, I, I want to talk about Ansible. Um, I'm mostly going to be going through Blue Box's Ursula repo, which is, in my opinion, one of the better um, uh, Ansible deployment, uh, you know, repos out there. So just going to kind of kind of walk through that with you guys and show you, you know, what what we've done, um, you know, some of the patterns that we've used to solve some kind of like ad hoc operational things, uh, integration testing, just kind of a whole, you know, different different kind of things we've done. So um, I'm John Dewey. Uh, I don't really. I don't really have much to say about that. I've done you know, a lot of Chef, a lot of Ansible, and OpenStack for the last almost four years. Um, so has any of you guys, are any of you guys familiar with Ansible at all by any, by any chance? This is awesome. Very cool. Um, so this is just something that I kind of just put together here. It's, it's uh, Ansible can do multi-tier deployments. Um, it can orchestrate. Um, it's obviously, you know, kind of, geared to be quite simple. Um, and uh, you know, you're writing YAML versus custom code. And if you want, want to write modules, you can write modules in any language you want. And so those modules I'll talk more about here shortly. Uh, this is just a brief uh, kind of high level diagram of what Ansible does. Um, you know, transports here. You, you basically, your transports are how you're gonna SSH into the box or you can, they have other transports available, zero MQ. You kind of have a library of uh, modules. Um, and then it's just a matter of going out to those servers, performing the actions it needs to perform, um, and it does sequencing. So you can do it on more than one of a type, particular type of role, or it can just go and, you know, you can tell it to do serially. So for, in, in a particular case of that is Percona. If you're setting up Percona or Rabbit, sometimes you want to flip it onto serial one and it will perform the first action first on the first node, do what it needs to do, then drop to your second node, do what it needs to do. And it's kind of, it's kind of nice. It's not the whole eventual convergence where everything just runs all at once and if it fails, it fails, but the next time the agent happens to run it to kind of rectify it. So, uh, along with simplicity in mind, uh, super easy to install. You really have very little dependencies. You just need, you know, Python and, and SSH. Uh, you know, you can install it through pip, apt, yum, you, you know, you name it, get, check it out, you know, and you just need to install it on your, uh, on a server that has SSH access to those particular hosts. <clears throat> uh, serverless, so um, that may or may not be a good thing for some people. Some, you know, there's obviously camps who believe there should be uh, servers. There's other camps who feel it's not, you know, that you don't need it. But again, for being sim simple, it, it, you know, it's not necessarily a requirement, and it's uh, it's it's a pretty nice thing to have. You just can kind of install Ansible and run it out on all your servers. No no server necessary. Uh, agentless. So uh, again, I kind of put an asterisk next to this. Um, you know, there's Agent Smith up there. Uh, uh, so again, you know, this is a, a, to a topic of high debate, right? You have camps who really believe there should be agents and those that don't. Um, I have never, I have not run anything at scale with, you know, 60,000 nodes where, uh, you know, an agent is, you know, where. SSH to those hosts would be an issue, but I'm sure that there's people around here who, who have run into, into those types of issues. So uh, that's kind of why I wanted to prefix it with a star where it may or may not be a bad thing. Uh, it's kind of up to you guys to decide uh, your opinion. Uh, and then uh, it's all powered by YAML, which is, uh, which is pretty cool. So this is just a, a simple, you know, this is basically just a simple uh, 
diagram here to show that uh, you know, we've just installed uh, three packages, smem, socat, and pstack. Um, this is using a syntax. Uh, uh, Ansible has a, a pretty nice uh, language. And so it is, it is uh, YAML, but there's some loops here. And so we're just saying, let's take these three items in that uh, list, and let's just iterate over them with item and install the package using apt. Obviously, so if you were to want, if you're using Red Hat, then you'd need to change that. Uh, but again, you, you, you could, there's a little bit better patterns to kind of clean that up, so it wouldn't be as hard coded as that. Uh, here's kind of going over the different uh, different loops and the expressions that they have. So there's, you know, I, I really don't want this to be an Ansible 101 talk. Uh, you know, I kind of just want to give you some information about Ansible, and then there's plenty of uh, documentation that you can find online if you have questions about uh, these particular uh, loops. Uh, conditionals. So, if you want, you know, that if for some reason you want to uh, to do something when a result uh, when something uh, failed or succeeded, there's ways, uh, in Chef you kind of have the, the guards uh, as well. Puppet has guards, this is the same type of, same type of way you do it in Chef or Puppet or whatnot, but again, it's just listed in plain old YAML. Uh, there's many, many, many modules, uh, 62 at the moment in my last Git checkout, uh, just related to cloud, uh, 229, uh, for various tasks, F5s, load balancers, um, line in file if you want to do kind of like a, a nice item potent uh, search and replace for files in a, or for text in a file. Um, uh, it, it, there's, it, basically Ansible kind of has the notion of let's put everything inside the core library and let's support every, as much as we can versus the other option of let's give you some and then if you're looking for other things, you kind of have to search you know, different sites or different Git repos and kind of find out what happens to be the current community hotness and, and kind of pull that in. Uh, for example, uh, you know, recently I was trying to do a simple pull a gzip file down, uncompress it, and stick it in a directory. That, oddly enough, I had to go search the internet for that, for, for uh, a particular different uh, 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 CM I was using. So, so this kind of kind of wanted to just go over a module file now. Um, kind of the important thing to see here is that you're registering a variable, and then you're using that variable later. So this kind of this small small you know description here is saying to uh, uh, on localhost we're going to go ahead and use a, a local connection. Uh, and perform this key pair, uh, it's, it's calling the Nova API and generating a key pair. Once it generates the key pair, it saves it off, and then you can later use that key pair in other tasks that need it. So we could have obviously uh, up front just created a whole bunch of variables and said use these variables, but this is kind of a nice, you know, since we're at OpenStack, we figured we'd talk about spinning, creating key pairs, spinning up a VM, setting security groups, and then you know, using that uh, key pair. So I kind of just wanted to highlight that uh, in this particular example, um, we're registering a variable with the name of the security group, and then when we're over here using Neutron to open ports, we're using that security group that we had created. And then later down here, um, we're associating a floating IP, registering that floating IP's address, and then using that um, when waiting for it to boot. So you can just use IP, and, and it's kind of nice. Ansible has a nice clean way to just wait. Once port 22 comes up, which we've defined uh, with a delay of five seconds, once it comes up, you can assume that everything is at least good to go and you can, 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 continue, can continue on. Um, and this is generally the pattern that you'll find in most Ansible uh, playbooks or roles. Uh, this happens to be a playbook. I can talk more about that here you know, shortly. Um, but I think that's all. Oh, and, and also modules are chainable. So what I mean by chainable is I've chained the output of this one into the input of this one. And so if you, def if you write your modules right, 
you could make sure that your modules return data that's relevant to another, or that, that's relevant. And so in this case, this happens to be a, a module that I, that I got upstreamed into Ansible, and it returns the floating IP, so you can then use it later. Um, this is just kind of a, you know, obviously we're not gonna go over this whole thing, but this is just an example of what a module looks like. And so, um, which module is this? Uh, this is the key pair, key pair module. So um, it can be written in shell, Python, Perl, whatever you really want, so long as you, um, it, with the Pyth for example, in the Python module, so long as you return JSON, you're good. Uh, if you were to do shell, you'd have to return certain variables or certain key value uh, variables for Ansible to then know what to do with it. But it's pretty much as it says here, this is black, you know, this is magic. So Ansible kind of takes care of it so long as you follow their conventions. Uh, briefly, uh, kind of talking about the way you configure Ansible, uh, it has a notion of hosts and this uh, right here is a group. So in our example, we've def defined an identity group, and that's where we're like, we're gonna install Keystone or whatnot. Um, you do have to have SSH access. You can pseudo access or not. You know, you could, it's uh, fully configurable. Uh, there's a notion of inventory. So inventory is simply how you wanna set particular variables or um, uh, it also kind of, Ansible also discovers facts about your systems. So uh, people familiar with Factor OHI, you can also use Factor OHI with Ansible, um, but by default, it doesn't, use, it doesn't use those. And so if you were to go out and deploy, it goes out and generates facts about that system, for example, interfaces and IP addresses, and then you can use those inside the YAML for, um, or inside templates or inside other things that you may want to then populate your templates or, um, you know, do, do what you would normally do uh, with any other uh, content management system. Um, <clears throat> so uh, in this example, we're just simply defining that identity, which is our Keystone system, has the following ports, and we're using a UID for auth strategy. Uh, and then these can later be used in other uh, playbooks or roles to then grab that information and populate templates. Uh, playbooks are kind of what Ansible uses. Uh, everything essentially comes down to a playbook. You may have roles, uh, but you need a playbook to say what host a, either a task is gonna be run on or a role is gonna be run on. So in this example here, we're saying let's install base, memcache, Apache 2, and the Keystone uh, role. And as you see, um, here, this is kind of an interesting syntax. So this is where you can kind of override values that you had defined in your inventory with uh, particular overrides that you may need for uh, the deployment you're doing. So if maybe this is a dev deployment, you may want a different role uh, or a different port for, for Keystone. Um, and so this, this pattern is followed pretty heavily by the, the Ansible the Ansible guys, I've, I've never really gotten into it. I hadn't used it too, too much, but as Galaxy got released, and Galaxy is kind of a, a site where everybody's trying to share their roles and kind of get, the, it's, it's almost like the, the community site for sharing reusable um, ways to do things. So, you know, you have an MySQL role, you'll have your Apache role. Uh, it's a way to share common uh, Ansible tasks. Uh, and so I myself have never gotten too into, I have never gotten into this particular pattern, but it's used quite a bit in, in uh, the upstream community, and, and so um, I thought I'd kind of highlight that here. And again, this is how you target a role. So before when you saw uh, here our identity group, over here when we're using the playbook here to actually execute it, it's gonna execute on the identity on the identity group. And again, uh, I'd already talked about this. Uh, here's a link to Galaxy for those of you kind of who, have, who haven't heard of Galaxy before. And uh, so here's, uh, we'd already talked about roles briefly, but this is, a, this is basically how you'd find a, a, a roles layout much like you would a, a, you know, a cookbook or whatnot. They kind of have a general, set, a general hierarchy to, to lay things out. Um, 
if you were to use Galaxy Ansible, you can actually use Ansible to generate a scaffolding, and you'll get this very, this very layout here. And you have everything you need. So uh, Ansible pretty much ships with, with everything you need. You just need SSH, and you're good to go. Uh, pretty much like a semi with a cruise ship, right? I mean, there's, there's everything you'd ever need there. Uh, so you're not going to see this. This is I, I couldn't fit this all on the page. This is somewhat somewhat uh, scrunched down, uh, and there's more to it than this. But this this actually right here um, is the Ursula deployment of their stack, and so of their OpenStack stack. And so um, there's it goes you know there's much more to this, but I kind of wanted to just give you an idea that there is orchestration involved. So my, the biggest problem that I had when when deploying OpenStack is you kind of have prerequisites. So you need your Rabbit installed if you happen to be using Rabbit. You need MySQL installed if you're using, if you have Percona set up, you're gonna want your cluster set up. Uh, if you're using Rabbit cluster, you want your Rabbit cluster set up. Then you can finally get to Keystone. Once you have Keystone installed, then you can start deploying kind of the rest of your stack. And so the biggest problem that I always had personally was just getting things to converge in the right order and getting things to happen in the right order. So with Ansible and you know, Salt has the same kind of overlay, or the, uh, you know, same similar system. You can kind of define how you want things to occur, and based on that, then you can make assumptions that, okay, by this time, everything's done, and I can go ahead and install the rest of my computes. And so, from, when I usually try and get people into OpenStack, I usually point them to this, so they can see what occurs when, and also it kind of, it's easy to grok. You can just look at it and say, ah, oh, I get it. I'm not hunting around the repo to find what gets installed where, and I'm not looking through all kinds of other places to figure out what, what happens. So just to kind of highlight some of that, so uh, this is installing the Rabbit uh, controller. Um, over here we have uh, in setting up Procona. And this is all, uh, I have reference in the in the slides, so you can go look in the reference and look at Ursula, and you guys can, can see more of this. But I just kind of wanted to detail some of it, that this is kind of where the orchestration is occurring, and then highlight some of the kind of the relevant parts of that that would normally be a little more difficult to do, how, how it's kind of handled in, in uh, this particular case. And so here, you know, we have a, um, an arbiter. We have two, um, uh, two MySQL ser or two you know Percona servers in the cluster along with an arbiter, and then at the bottom we've uh, set up a uh, backup as well. So we're performing backups, and those all equate to roles, and those roles are all in the repo, um, and they're managed all through. It, currently they're not upstreamed, but uh, Michael Dehan has actually had interest in us uh, upstreaming those. Uh, again, we're highlighting more of this. We're installing memcache. Uh, dealing with Keystone, setting up Neutron, uh, and then uh, restarting OVS. And here is some more work around Swift. Um, set up Glance, or set up Swift, and then uh, point Glance, and then set up Glance, and Glance happens to, to, uh, to use Swift. More on orchestration. So an interesting thing you can do, and this is kind of a weird, crazy cuckoo thing to do, but uh, people do do it. They're orchestrating using Ansible and orchestra, uh, orchestrating Chef with Ansible. And you know, some may believe this is the wrong way to do things, but I, I don't really see it as a, a bad thing, at least, you know, especially in the case that maybe you're wanting to switch from one to another, and you just are, you know, or you're trying to get around problems where maybe you're saying, let me just use Fabric to kind of do things in the right order. Um, I, I personally don't see too, too big of an issue, you know, doing this. And, and uh, in, in a particular case that I'm at right now, we, we're, we're trying to switch to something else, and I see, uh, see this as a good pattern to follow where you can do it, temp you know, do it for the time being, have Ansible orchestrate you know, something else, and then maybe start switching over to, you know, switching over to Ansible and piecemealing things as you kinda, kind of uh, get more familiar with it or as, you're, as time permits. So again, this may be crazy, some of you may not like this, but uh, it's worked pretty well in the, uh, for us in the past. Um, so along the lines of this kind of, I'm not necessarily talking about OpenStack deployment anymore. Um, I just wanted to highlight 
the different ways that you could do OpenStack deployment and, and kind of point you guys to a repo and give you enough information about Ansible where you can kind of then start poking at the repos and get more familiar with it. Um, this is now more along the, ta the tasks of why, what are other reasons you would use Ansible? And um, I ran into this particular use case uh, not too long ago where um, guys are writing fabric to do this. And it's not item potent. Um, everybody's kind of rolling their own thing. This could have been a shell script, right? Um, but kind of the key is, you know, why, why necessarily do that when it's kind of already been solved for you? You can turn that into this. Um, and this is just a task, sets up a network, and this you could just have Ansible execute for you. So I kind of, uh, you know, over, uh, I kind of like to show the comparison because I feel like that, that is, you know, kind of nice. People have already done the hard work for you. You just need to, you know, just make sure that you are using it. It's also good for one-time tasks. So this is a bit of a contrived example. This would very likely go into cron. Um, if you wanted to clean up your, you know, your keystone tokens, uh, your old keystone tokens. However, we have run into situations where um, people do go into the database and they twiddle stuff around, next thing you know your database is blown up and you're spending the next six hours fixing it. Um, so I kinda, this is contrived in the sense that this isn't something you'd necessarily put in a one-time task, but you would do something similar if, for example, um, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to, you're, you're, you want to do something else, you could stick this into a task, get it through Garrett or whatever type of, you know, if you're using Git, GitHub or whatever you're using, and get people to peer review what you're doing and look at it and say, okay, that's, that's something that's okay for the operations people to run anytime they're experiencing a particular problem. And then it's, you have eyes on it, people can see exactly what it's doing. You could even name it correctly so when others look at it, they know what it does. And then you go ahead and, once that's checked in and people have agreed with it and peer reviewed it, then that's what the ops guys happen to run. There's none of this jump on the server, let's you know, hack around and, and then uh, 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 break the database like, like we did. So, uh, More one-time tasks. Uh, so this is just another example of things you can do with uh, Ansible. And again, we're uh, registering this here. We're just performing it. So, so with Ansible, you, if, if you want to register a variable or the result, you actually have to do, as far as I know, I may be wrong, but I'm fairly confident, you have to kind of do a shell command. It takes this and, out and basically saves it as uh, a variable. And then later, you can do this, you, this will only get executed if this is not zero, right? So that's kind of the, uh, I'm sorry, if the return code is non-zero. So th these are, again, kind of nice things that you can do. It's pretty easy, and it's a little nicer than just shell, and you can kind of, nobody wants to write a bunch of uh, if-then conditionals in shell over SSH when you can just do it here and you get that flexibility. I just had to throw this in here, heart bleed, right? I just kind of had to just throw it in here. Uh, this is, again, a, a kind of a nice example. I grabbed this from somebody at, when, when heart bleed occurred, this was already posted, this was already out there. Um, but it's, the, the, the thing about this that I thought was nice is, you know, sure, you could just for loop, you could just go ahead and throw, bang it out there, but there's a little more, it's a little more elegant than that. You can just, uh, it's again, using the uh, register, um, it's, it, it's a little more of a, uh, I, would, I guess I would say it's a little more of a, uh, a cleaner approach to, and, and, and the Ansible guys released this as soon as Heartbleed came out, and I just felt like I had to throw it in there. Uh, and, so, and then integration testing. So this, this is kind of one of the parts that I thought was pretty cool. So when we deploy OpenStack, you know, you either, it's, it's either working or parts of it aren't working or, or um, you, you kind of want to validate that, that, that what you did in your roles and playbooks actually perform those actions on the server. So sure, we can run um, any other, we, you know, we could have run Tempest, for example, and we do. But it's nice, this is, this is kind of an example of, for everything on the first controller here, go ahead and run these commands to validate that at least that bit of functionality that you had done is working. Whoops. Yeah, I'm late for stand-up, guys. Um, but, but I find this actually pretty, 
pretty cool. Um, this, this, is, this is actually doing things kind of the old way. Ansible, I'll, I'll get to that next. Ansible has, has actually has a, a way to deal with this. With, they've added some nice assertions to the language. But this is the way that, we, that we're doing it currently and, and uh, uh, haven't migrated to the new assert language. But I, but I actually kind of like this. I think it's, it's pretty reasonable. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of shell commands, but you know, this is usually kind of a one-time thing that you run after uh, you run your set of playbooks. And, and so I thought this would be nice to highlight. Here is the new assert language. So Ansible's kind of had a, added this whole assert that and then this particular um, result of a variable. So they, they, save off, um, they save off this register here, so this D package result, and then later they use it in their assertion. And so uh, this is used extensively throughout the, an the Ansible roles that, they've been provide that they provide. Um, and this eventually at some point, if, I guess if we want to do it right, you sh we should start using this language in here. Um, so common patterns. Obviously, this isn't too cool here. Um, I don't like the fact that I need to take all of this and copy pasta this into five other places throughout the code. Um, I kind of want to take this as, as, as a point to kind of say, um, uh, this particular pattern that I have, I don't know how to solve. And it's, you know, for example, like Chef has libraries. You can have library cookbooks. I could easily hide all of this into a single library cookbook and in my template just invoke that method call and get back my list of rabbit servers. If any of you know how to do this in Ansible, haven't figured it out. I don't know a clean way to solve this particular problem without copying it all over the place. And there's plenty of other patterns I have like this that tend to get placed into other parts of, uh, of Ursula. And so I kind of wanted to, to highlight this as Ansible is super awesome. I like it. Um, there's just certain patterns that I don't think it solves. Uh, it, it doesn't solve everything as far as uh, library, library patterns. And variables can be tricky. So that's, I've spent so much time dealing with variables and, and, and trying to get things to follow, I guess, the mindset that I had when I had used uh, chef, that, that it doesn't exactly equate right into Ansible. So with, with Ansible, it's the variable defined closest to the role generally wins. So way back, this is probably a bad idea, but let's do it anyways, I got time. So way back here, right here, anything defined in here always wins. So if you were to want to override this, the only way to override that is to define it, is to override it here. That's, that's only, and, and the reason that is, is because you want to look at your, I guess, well, the main reason that that was there is you want to know exactly, you don't want to be looking at something saying, where that variable gets set? I'm kind of looking here, here, here. You want to be able to look right where it was executed and see where it was defined. So it's kind of a simplicity. It's, it's a take on simplicity. You know exactly where to look and you're not hunting all over the place to find out where things were defined. With that said, though, it, it, it has turned and it, it has been a bit of complexity on my end. I, I'm not exactly entirely happy with the way variables are. Um, and maybe that's just me. I need to change my particular outlook on this. But it, it, when sharing roles amongst the community, um, It'd be nice if, if uh, there was a way to better handle, handle variables. And so in this particular case, <clears throat> this is actually, so in this particular case, I've defined memcache on this particular port. And I kind of wanted to, to highlight this. If in Horizon, I wanted to have Horizon use memcache and pull in those variables that were defined in this particular role, I would have to add memcached to, the to that playbooks run list, essentially. Otherwise, those variables are out of scope. You can't get to them, which has unintended side effect of installing memcached on that host. You may not want memcached installed on that host. So again, this is just a, a scenario that we ran into where I may not want memcached installed on here, but I kind of want to be doing the right thing, and I want to use the variable set in this role. 
So, the, and, and you guys have, you know, uh, there's quite a few Ansible people here. This may be a problem that's already been solved and you guys are saying, you know, I may not be doing it exactly correct, but this is a use case that we ran into that was somewhat annoying. And again here, um, this is again a slightly annoying, uh, a, a annoying problem where you just have to be careful with how you use variables. It's just, you know, it's very simple, Ansible is simple, the playbooks are simple, but it just, you just have to be cautious with what you do. In this case, we're saying uh, in, this, in, these, in this inventory, we're gonna cluster rabbit. And so when, Ansible, when you run Ansible, it's gonna parse the inventory, it's gonna parse those group variables, and it's gonna say, okay, we're gonna cluster. Down here, if you happen to redefine your vars to uh, say the defaults that rabbit, the default file that rabbit had, it would then reset that potentially reset this to false. And so this is probably very likely a bad pattern to do. Don't, you know, don't do this anyways. But, the, you know, again, you wouldn't know this unless you actually did it, that this is a, a, a kind of a, a weird situation where how things can get rendered depends on where you are in the, uh, the, the uh, site file. And, and so the way we solved variables is we decided, let's just stick everything into inventory, we wrote a custom plugin for it, and we make sure that everything is defined in one spot, we don't have to worry about if, if, if things get defined in roles or whatnot, define it in one place, and we, um, we ended up making a plugin so, oh, well, I didn't, Craig actually did, but we ended up making it a plugin so uh, for the pattern of, we were deploying many different open stacks on, uh, for different customers. And so you have a lot of common things that get repeated over and over again. You have your common um, ports, you know, memcache runs on the same common ports. Most everything kind of stayed the same, but there was other things that had changed. So we wrote this plugin that basically just combined everything, merged the hash into the way we liked it, and then Ansible had, ha Ansible uses that. So it solves a lot of the problems where Defaults are defined here, overrides are defined here. We just kind of do it in one place and it all trickles through down to the, to the rest of the system. Ah, dev stack, I thought I deleted this. Um, so this is, this, this is kind of a, we, we, we could obviously discuss this till we're blue in the face, but it, I, I was thinking, kind of getting your feedback, it, you know, dev stack's pretty much all shell code. Um, it would have been kind of interesting if DevStack might be implemented in Ansible. It's just a thought. I'm not saying it should be done, but just kind of to get your feedback on it. I think, you know, if DevStack was written in Ansible, or most of it was, you'd already have, uh, you know, you could switch some variables and, you know, deploy from packages if you wanted, if, and, and you would already have a open stack that's deployable out of the box because you're deploying it on your local box using Ansible. So you, you kind of, it, it was more of a thought and just thinking that might be an interesting, you know, thing to, thing to do, but it by no means was intended on something that we have to do. It was just, a, just kind of a thought. And that is all. Thank you. Questions? Oh, was that good? No, no questions? Got one guy right here. You can go to the microphone. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Um, sure. That dev stack thing is a crazy idea, but I was thinking about it too. So uh, it's a total crazy idea, right? Yeah, just for fun, it could be yeah. fun. Yeah. Um, quick question: Do you have any recommendations on how you might share roles? I know about Galaxy, yeah. but inside a private team without putting it on the public Galaxy site. So. So my buddy uh, Craig actually wrote this pretty, I'd have to find the link, but he, he essentially wrote this tool that you could give it a repo, and you can, it's almost, it's almost like a Burke shelf, but not for pointing in and saying, here's a repo, here's either a branch or a tag or a Git ref, uh, URL, and pull that into your Ansible repo. So, other than that, there is no, that I'm aware of, no other way to do that other than pulling straight out of Galaxy or having some other solution. He, he actually wrote the solution. It's actually pretty good. Um, 
uh, and you could actually, you could very likely use it with Galaxy if you, you know, just, you just have to update it to understand the, the Galaxy API. But other than that, no, uh, maybe you could submodule if, if you knew the Git, if you knew the Git uh, URL, you could submodule it, but, you know, some people don't like submodules, so. Great, thanks. Sure. You got anything? No? Cool. So in one of your examples, you uh, were uh, validating state of your deployed cloud, sort of like uh, doing, you know, post-run tests. How does Ansible handle failures in that case? Do those tasks, when they fail, does it exit out or does it log yeah. it and continue? Yeah, so if anything fails, it, it errors and exits out. And then it leaves you at a state where you can uh, basically leave some files on disk that you could then uh, uh, resume from. Yeah, cool. All right, thank you very much.